Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for joining us this afternoon. My name is Casey Pierce, and I am the Associate Director of External Relations and Marketing for NYIT College of Osteopathic Medicine. We're so glad that uh, you have taken time to join us this afternoon to learn about uh, where we stand with COVID-19. We've got two uh, great panelists this afternoon, expertise in their field that are gonna tell us from both a health standpoint and an economic development standpoint uh, where we stand in, in the midst of this virus and um, the way that our world's kind of been shaken a little bit. So uh, Mr. Clint O'Neill is the Executive Vice President of Global Business for the Arkansas Economic Development Commission. And Dr. Shane Spites is the Dean of NYIT College of Osteopathic Medicine at Arkansas State University. Dr. Spites is going to start by sharing a lengthy overview of the, the virus, how it spread, what it is, how we can protect ourselves, the latest medications and treatments. Then Clint's going to tell us a little bit about where the uh, economic impact in Arkansas that the pandemic has had. Um, then we've got some pre-submitted questions that we're going to uh, read for, and both of our panelists will answer. So I uh, want to start, want to introduce Dr. Shane Spites. He's going to go first. Uh, again, Dr. Spites is the Dean of NYIT Comet A State. He's also the Medical Director for the City of Jonesboro. Dr. Spites is a, a Jonesboro, excuse me, an Arkadelphia native. He attended Henderson State University and Arkansas State University before going to medical school at Kansas City University for uh, Medicine and Biosciences at the College of Osteopathic Medicine there. He's a family physician, has worked as a hospital administrator, and joined NYITCOM um, from prior to its inception, first as the Assistant Dean of Academic Affairs and was promoted to the Dean of our college in 2016. So Dr. Spites, thank you for uh, taking your time today. We look forward to hearing your presentation. Thank you, Casey. I appreciate the opportunity to speak um, on this, this important topic. Um, I'd like to go ahead and, and extend our thanks as well to Clint for taking time out of his, his schedule to be able to present the economic information. I know that that's um, obviously valuable information that everybody needs to hear as well. So I'm uh, happy to be able to share the stage with him. I'll go ahead and uh, get started um, on, on my slides. I've got, um, I've got some things that we're gonna kind of go over here. Um, let me go ahead and get that started. Um, all right, everybody should be able to see that. Casey, can you give me a nod just to make sure that we're seeing the right? All right, got a thumbs up from Casey. That means I can move forward. So let me go ahead and just give you a little bit of a, of, a, um, of a warning, so to speak. Obviously, the last seven months or so has been a whirlwind for everybody. Um, certainly us in the medical field and the research and science side uh, continue to scramble to keep up with the new information and the new research that's coming out. Um, I took this approach for this, uh, for this presentation uh, just to kind of start at zero. Basically, we're gonna start with uh, what the coronavirus is, COVID-19, and we're gonna bring you up to date in terms of what we know, what we don't know, and kind of what we can expect in the coming months. So hopefully, this will be uh, enlightening. Some of this information you already may have, some of it may be new to you. Um, obviously, we can, you can post some, some questions or comments. I believe this is also being recorded, and, and if needed, we can get uh, copies of the, um, the PowerPoint to you. So hopefully we're going to move, uh, move beyond Facebook in terms of uh, where most of your knowledge um, on COVID-19 may be coming from. I, um, it, it is really just a whirlwind out there um, and, and some of the blame we'll take ourselves and the medical community in terms of uh, not putting as much out there as, as we could be. So this is another attempt for us to try to put out good information, hopefully uh, dispel myths and, and, um, and allow people to really understand what's going on so when you hear the word coronavirus or COVID-19 or COVID or SARS-CoV-2, that's all the same virus that we're talking about uh, in general when you hear that nowadays. Uh, coronavirus or the COVID-19, it's got a family tree just like you do. Um, and it actually has its own descendants and it's, it has its own relatives, so to speak. So this COVID-19 is related to other viruses like SARS or MERS. It's also related to a common cold virus. So, Every year in the winter and in the fall, coronaviruses circulate as the common cold. Um, as you might imagine, we don't already have a vaccine for those viruses and we don't have medications for them. So you can see immediately where that kind of puts us at a disadvantage when we're trying to attack this one. Now, this is something called a novel virus, which means it's not really been found in circulation before 
this pandemic. And so we really didn't have any previous knowledge of this specific strain, which means that we really didn't have anything in our armamentarium to be able to fight it off. But it is important you recognize the other viruses that it's related to. And let's talk about how it actually infects you. So how does it actually get into your cell? Well, much like a lock and key system, uh, viruses or bacteria, they have to make way or make entry into your cells, into your lung cells or into the, the cells in your nose or in your mouth. And so they do this, the coronavirus does this by use of what's called a spike protein. And it attaches to a specific receptor. And I realize I'm getting scientific, but just bear with me on this. This specific receptor is called an ACE2 receptor. And why that's important is because wherever the ACE2 receptor is located in your human body, that's where the coronavirus can infect. And that will tell you why you have some of the symptoms that you have or why certain individuals have damage to certain organs. And this next slide shows that. Unfortunately, the ACE2 receptor is located in many organs throughout the body, which means that COVID-19 or the coronavirus can infect all of these areas. So yes, it can get into your bloodstream and infect your liver. Um, it can infect the kidneys and the pancreas. Uh, we have evidence of heart damage. I'll talk about that a little later. Obviously into the lungs and of course the nasal passages. One of the things it can also do, and you've got a picture of, the, of an artery here on the right-hand side of your slide. One of the things the virus can also do is it can increase clotting formation. Um, it can increase clotting formation on the side of the veins and also on the sides of the arteries. Well, that's not a good thing because if you have a clot in your arteries, that can lead to strokes, heart attacks, and um, organs that get damaged. If you have a clot on the venous side, that ends up being a blood clot that can go to your lungs that can cause problems. So that's one of the other things that we have found out about this virus that, that obviously is worrisome. And again, these are things that typically don't occur with other viruses uh, that we see that are spread through the respiratory tract. And that moves us on into how is this spread? Well, typically the virus is gonna come in through your nose or your mouth. There is evidence that it can be spread through the eyes, though that's not very common. It can move into the eyes um, and spread there, but it's more common to come through the nose and the mouth, which is why we promote the mask wearing. It actually migrates, it actually moves into the lungs. And what I mean by that is once it gets into your nose, the virus itself actually starts moving down the back of your throat and into your lungs. That presents a problem in terms of testing for it, because if we test for it, and let's say the virus has already moved down the back of your throat and all the way and, and entering close to your lungs, the test of your nose swab may be negative. And so again, that presents a challenge for us. So there's a certain window of time where testing is most useful, which is usually three to five days, um, but sometimes that's not even perfect. And so obviously that presents a problem in trying to identify who are positives. So sometimes we will go based on the symptoms that we see, and you'll see that in the next slide. Again, it can spread through the bloodstream and it can infect other organs. This is a highly contagious virus. It's much more contagious than influenza. It's not as contagious as the measles. The measles is an extremely contagious virus that spreads very rapidly from person to person. So a good thing about this is it's not as, not as infectious as that, but it does spread worse uh, and more readily than influenza. And it spreads through respiratory droplets, which are basically water droplets as you're speaking or singing or coughing or sneezing. These droplets go out in the atmosphere in front of you um, and the virus is loaded up in those respiratory droplets. Again, the idea behind the cloth mask is to bind up those droplets so that they don't spread to people in front of you. It can live on surfaces. Initially, the evidence showed that it lived on surfaces for many days or even weeks. We now know that's probably not true. It does like to live on smooth surfaces and hard surfaces. Um, you're not gonna see it really living on clothing or cloth or things like that. Um, but it can live for up to 24 to 48 hours. So you want to make sure you disinfect those surfaces uh, daily for individuals that are using uh, certainly common areas. Aerosolized, that's been a big debate recently. I talked to you just now, just now about respiratory droplets. The term aerosolized means that it actually hangs out in the air. So the virus can actually float around in the air and go well beyond six feet. One of the problems with that is if it gets sucked up into your ventilation system, it can infect the person in the office next to you. So if you're sick, even if you happen to cough and you've got a closed door, but the vent system sucks it up and carries it through the HVAC system, it could potentially infect others. Now, we think that's likely, but the evidence is not 
ironclad that that's what happens. We've kind of tested some things in labs and we believe that it happens. We just don't know how often that spread occurs. There have been some case studies of individuals getting infected that way, but again, it's not been widespread in terms of the cases we found. The virus is pretty sneaky. And what we mean by that is it can actually be in your body and you don't know it for several days. That's where the term asymptomatic comes from or pre-symptomatic. So basically you can get infected by this virus. It can be reproducing in your nose and the back of your throat for a couple of days or more. You can actually be spreading it to individuals and you feel fine. You don't have a fever, you don't have a headache. You feel just like you did several days ago or several weeks ago. You can't tell that you're sick at all. That's one of the ways that the virus evades the immune system and is able to be able to jump from person to person is that it can spread so rapidly from people that are asymptomatic. The individuals that have the biggest risk of this disease, as you might imagine, which is for many diseases, as you get older, you're at increased risk. Significantly for those over 65 or over 70. If you have a chronic medical condition, um, uh, obesity seems to be one of the problems here in the South that we're seeing a lot of that individuals are having more difficulty with, but high blood pressure, heart disease, obviously lung problems. And kids with medical issues actually can have a strange uh, response. It's similar to something called, called Kawasaki's illness, but it's a systemic inflammatory process. Typically, these are kids that have underlying medical issues that have this. Uh, it's not common, but it does happen. Um, Middle-aged and younger individuals, for whatever reason, there's a special group, and we're still not sure why, that succumb to this pretty, um, pretty dramatically. And what I mean by that is they basically have the, their, this body's over-response to the virus. And so there'll be this huge over-response to the point where the body's attacking itself. We're still not quite sure why that's caused or really who's predisposed to that. There's probably a genetic uh, underlying issue there. When we talk about the symptoms that it causes, this is a list and I pulled this from the CDC. I wanna go ahead and put a plug in for the CDC, a great place to get information for you, your friends, your family, your coworkers. Uh, they've done a real good job of putting a lot of good information there. Now, I realize it's tough for them to keep up as well, uh, but the CDC I think has done a, done a really good job of putting a lot of information together in terms of guidance, in terms of answering common questions you hear in the public. So very much recommend going to the CDC website. A lot of these symptoms you'll see here are what you would see with the common cold or influenza. So it's kind of hard to tell the difference. It's going to get even harder this fall and this winter when we start seeing some of the flu cases, though hopefully we won't see as much. The current evidence shows right now that influenza in the southern hemisphere, uh, which, is, which is where it's wintertime right now, is not as bad as we expected. So we're hopeful that that will translate here. Primarily the reason why the flu season's not as bad in the Southern Hemisphere is because everybody's, as you would imagine, washing hands, socially distancing, and wearing a mask. Those same things protect you from influenza. So that's kind of a, a good thing, I guess, to look forward to is that maybe we'll have a much lighter flu season. One of the things I wanna draw your attention to is the loss of taste or smell. That's almost always gonna be COVID-19. Uh, I've had patients before that have had some mild symptoms and they only had, maybe they had a, a mild headache, but then they had the loss of taste or smell. That's COVID-19. I don't have to have a test. We go ahead and test for those as well. But just even if the test came back negative, those individuals have COVID-19 uh, until really proven otherwise. I mean, some medications can cause those, but we don't have any other viruses or any infections going around right now that would cause that. Um, so I think that's important to know. So how do you protect yourself from getting COVID-19? Well, you've heard this before through public service announcements and all over the internet, hopefully the hand washing, don't touch your face, social distancing, so basically limit the contact that you have with the individuals who might be sick, and the mask wearing. And that's gotten a lot of attention, certainly in the last couple of months. I'd like to speak just for a moment about that. The soft cloth mask, and by the way, we do know what kind of mask actually works best for you. It should be a three-ply, and it should be about a 70-30 blend. That's the best evidence. I'll show you the slide on, uh, uh, the next slide will actually show you the research behind that. You've heard about the N95 or the surgical mask. So here's the deal behind those. The N95 and surgical masks would be used by doctors, nurses, and people in the healthcare industry when they're in the hospital or in the clinic seeing COVID patients or seeing patients that may have COVID. These masks protect the wearer. That's what it was designed to do. That's what it was meant to do. The soft cloth mask, the reason behind it, was for me to wear it to protect you and for you to wear it to protect me. Because I've already said, I may be sick for a couple of days and not even know it. 
And so if I'm going to work and I'm sick and don't know it, um, then if I'm wearing my cloth mask, I'm very much limiting any spread that I might have to people around me. And so I wear the mask for you and you wear the mask for me. It does offer some protection. I don't want to make it sound like that there's zero protection by a cloth mask. It does offer some protection to wear, but by and large, the idea behind it is it limits the spread by those individuals who may be sick and don't know it. So again, the N95 mask, the surgical mask, those are to protect the wearer. That's what they were designed to do. And in terms of the six feet, you know, we really didn't make that up. When we say the six foot distancing, we know as you see in the slide there in the center, that's about how far the respiratory droplets travel. They only travel about three to six feet out in front of you. So if you've got on a cloth mask, it can prevent that. Cloth mask plus the six feet, now all of a sudden you've done a really good job at preventing the spread of the virus. And here's the slide that I was referring to earlier in terms of the different types of materials that have been tested and their effectiveness uh, in terms of preventing coronavirus uh, from moving or, or, or a like particle from moving through uh, that type of material. Coronavirus itself in terms of size, molecular size, it's actually pretty close to the same size as influenza, which kind of takes you back to my last comment, wearing a mask also would protect uh, the spread of influenza. So I think that's important that we've actually looked at this data in terms of the N95 mask, surgical mask, um, and you'll see the cotton blend there, the 7030 cotton blend, they, they, it also was protective in terms of uh, movement of particles. How do we test for coronavirus? How do we detect it? Well, you've probably heard about the PCR test, and that's by far the most common test. It has to be performed typically in a high complexity lab. And unfortunately, it can take days to get the result back. So it's not the best platform, but it's kind of what we've got. And this is just kind of, kind of is what it is, so to speak. The results can vary depending on the sample acquisition and handling and processing. And what I mean by that is, you know, there really aren't a lot of labs that can run these things. And so usually you got to get tested and then the test has got to get, let's say it's taken down to Little Rock. And so that's several hours down there and maybe it's sitting in a car. I mean, depending on how it's actually transported, you may have what's called degradation of the sample. So it could be that we run the sample and all of a sudden you were sick, but the sample, because it didn't make it down there in time, the sample says you're negative. Well, that's not good. The PCR mechanism itself of testing is actually a really good test. But the idea behind it would be that you tested somebody and you turned right around and ran it in the machine. It would be extremely accurate, extremely sensitive there. But again, these machines are very expensive. There's only a few of these in the entire state of Arkansas. I'll talk more about the issues with testing on the next slide. Antibody testing has been popular and it got a lot, it was kind of all the rage a few months ago. Unfortunately, it's just not that good. And, it's, and, and when you think about it, it, it's a neat idea. And if it works out that way, it would be awesome. Because in antibody testing, the idea behind it would be that I would test you for your antibody. So I would order an antibody test, a COVID-19 antibody test on you. And I would find out if you'd had COVID-19. Because some people have had it and may not know it yet. And so if you've got antibodies, well, that means you're good to go. That means you can go to restaurants. That means that you could go out and uh, go out with your friends or go to the beach or, you know, you, you could certainly be a little more freer in terms of what you're doing on social distancing if you've already had it to some degree. Uh, I still wouldn't fully recommend that. But the idea behind the antibody testing is you can at least feel a little better going out in the public. The problem is there were about 200 of these tests that hit the market when they first came out. And to be honest, a lot of them weren't good. The FDA put a lot of them on hold. It didn't allow them uh, to be pushed out in the market. The reason why is because they weren't testing for things that really um, were of value. Maybe it tested for the coronavirus like the common cold. Well, that's not helpful. Or maybe the level of COVID-19 that it was testing for was too low, which again is not helpful. And so we're having to kind of take a step back on the antibody testing. There is a new type of antibody testing called the neutralizing antibody test that is much more specific and will probably be useful. Unfortunately, we don't see that being widely available, meaning you can go to your doctor and get it until late 2020 or maybe into 2021. Uh, once that comes out though, that would be very helpful to let people know. The antigen testing is something you're hearing about now as well. That's the rapid test. And that's the test that you typically, if you went to your doctor's office for the flu and got tested for the flu, that's the kind of test you would get there. That's a rapid test. It's really good if it's positive, which means if we test you, let's say you got symptoms, we test you and you're positive, you can feel really good that that's a true positive. It's not really good if it's negative. If we test you and you're negative, it really doesn't mean anything. There's what's called a high false negative rate, 
which means it says you're negative and you're really positive. Well, again, that's not good. So we have to do a follow-up test called the, which is the PCR test to really see if you were negative or positive. So that's kind of a mixed bag in terms of the rapid testing. You'll hear more about that. I think we'll be using it more when we see a lot more circulating um, COVID-19 in the communities. Um, but right now, like I said, it's just kind of a mixed bag. It, and it's also not, it's only, it's only to be used for somebody with symptoms. So it's, if, you're, if you want to do an asymptomatic um, test, if you're like, hey, look, I just want to know, you know if, I've, if I've got it, I don't have any symptoms at all, it's a really not a good test for that at all. Uh, you may have heard something new about saliva testing that just came out in the last couple of weeks. A, a study came out actually just yesterday about that saying kind of, you know, don't get too excited because it's really not that great. I think that'll get there too. You know, we're slowly getting there with testing. It's not as fast as anybody wants it to be, uh, but just kind of hang tight on that. What about mass testing? What about testing all the colleges and universities and schools? That sounds like a good idea. If we're about to open those up. Maybe we should test all these kids that come back. You need to remember these tests are only good at that point in time. So when you test a student right then and you're waiting two or three days for the test to come back, they could leave and go out to eat the lunch with their friends or they could go to a party that night and then the test comes back three days later and says you're negative when actually by the time the test comes back you're positive. So there may or may not be and now there's a little bit of utility in terms of well if I find somebody that's positive I can go ahead and have them isolate. We'll talk about isolation in a second as well. Um, so there may be a little bit of benefit there but then you're like well is the you know is the squeeze worth the juice so to speak in terms of what we're getting out of that. JAMA, which is a very reputable journal article, uh, journal, which is the Journal of the American Medical Association, put out an article about this, that if campuses wanted to screen um, their students as they came back, they recommended every student on campus be tested every two days. Well, of course, nobody can do that. Number one, the logistics behind testing thousands of students every two days would be difficult. The cost involved with testing those students and recognizing the delay in the test results would also present a problem. Um, and so that's why it really wasn't latched on to. So what are the problems with testing? Why are we having such an issue in the country with testing? There's two main reasons why we're seeing this. Number one, there aren't a lot of vendors for the equipment and the supplies that we use to actually run the test. So in terms of the pipettes, in terms of the, um, you know, the little test kits themselves, all that's proprietary. And really they don't have capacity to ramp all this up to the level that's needed to be done right now for the US. So that's limiting. The other thing is that hospitals and clinics across the country, for the most part, they use something called reference lab. A reference lab is a national company. And basically that means that if I run a test, it goes to this national company and they result it and they send it back. And they've got lots of these machines. But the issue there is when you're seeing a big outbreak or a large number of, of cases in a certain area of the country, like we have recently in Florida, Texas, and California, all the resources get diverted there. So here in the state of Arkansas, you know, we were doing okay in testing until those outbreaks occurred in the other states. Then all of a sudden, doctors and hospitals and clinics couldn't get tests back. Well, it's because all the reagents and the test kits got sent elsewhere. They got shipped to other states that were having big outbreaks. And so it's kind of a trickle down effect. And so it just, it just shifts resources away from everybody else. Right now, and there's kind of a number all over the board, so it depends on what you look at, the U.S. should be performing about between 1.4 to 6 million tests a day. And we say 1.4 if we want to continue mitigation, uh, or 6.6 6 million if we want to suppress uh, in, in terms of viral suppression. That, those are the number of tests per day we should be running. Right now, we do good to hit 800,000 a day. So the United States certainly is under testing. Um, and we've got different um, issues as why that I just described as to why we're not testing as much as we can. What about the percent positivity? You hear about that as well. You know, very simply, it's the percent of tests that are done that have a positive result. You want that number to be low. You want to be able to test a whole lot of people and find out that a very few of them are positive. That means you're staying on top of the virus. That means that everybody's doing what they're supposed to in hand washing and mask wearing. You certainly want that number less than 10%, but you'd like for it to be less than 5%, especially when we talk about opening up schools. If it's lower, and obviously the lower it is, that means the better job that you're doing in keeping the virus at bay and keeping it under control. One of the caveats is though, if you don't test a lot of people, that number can be skewed. Uh, it doesn't really, get, it's not really accurate. So what happens if you're not testing enough people, then what do you do? Well, you can look at the hospitalization rate. 
you don't want to look at the hospitalization rate, but it does give you a more accurate picture of the burden of disease that occurs in your area. Because whether you're testing or not, if people get sick with COVID and end up in the hospital, they're going to end up in the hospital regardless of whether they're tested. So you don't want to rely on that because it means you're behind in terms of testing, but it can be an indicator of really what's going on in your community. Well, how do we fight COVID? What are the ways that we can actually um, um, address this with medications? I went ahead and pulled some of the top medications that are in, uh, in the media now, and I went ahead and addressed a few of those. You need to know, though, there's 300 or more trials going on right now that are looking at different medications already in our medicine cabinet, really to see, look, is there something, do we already have an antiviral that works? Do we have some sort of um, you know, a, immune modulating medication that might be beneficial? So we're kind of trying everything. Nothing's really jumping out. A few things show some promise, but nothing that we would say, hey, if you get COVID, take this. So we're not there yet. So in the news, and everybody's heard about this in the beginning, hydroxychloroquine plus azithromycin, which is called Zithromax or without it, you need to know the evidence is still not good on that. Um, it's being studied, but we need randomized studies. And so some of the studies that are out that show a positive, like there's a, you see an article in the top left-hand corner that showed that there was a positive outcome. And then you see on the top right-hand corner, a study out of JAMA for mild to moderate in, in individuals who had COVID, and it was a bad outcome. In the bottom right, you see that there was a VA study that actually showed more deaths by taking that medication. That's not good. Well, so well, how do you know? How do you know what study to believe? Well, this is where you really get into the research and the science side of, of dissecting these, these journal articles and this, these studies. And what I mean by that is many of the studies that are showing positive results in hydroxychloroquine are not randomized. And let me just give you an example of what I mean by that. Let's say, I'll use a baseball analogy. Let's say you've got a baseball team and you've got five people in the baseball team that are your top five hitters, okay? So you take your top five hitters and you put them in a group. Let's say you take your five worst hitters and you put them in a group, okay? You give the five best hitters an aluminum bat. You give the five worst hitters a wooden bat. And then you see who does a better job hitting the ball. Well, it's gonna be no surprise to you that the five best hitters with the aluminum bat, that's gonna be, they're gonna be do better than the five worst hitters. So you can't draw the conclusion then that the aluminum bat is better than, than the wooden bat because you, it's, you didn't randomize it. You basically picked who was in each group. That's the issue with a lot of these studies we're seeing is they picked who was in each group. So for the COVID-19, the hydroxychloroquine piece, if you pick young people who weren't gonna get that sick anyway and you put them in one group and you gave them hydroxychloroquine and then you pick the older people and you didn't give it to them who were not gonna do well anyway, well, that's not a good study. That's a bias study. It's not a randomized study. So that's what we'd like to see more of. And those are coming, they're underway. It just takes a long time to do those studies. It's not something we can turn around in a couple of months and do. You gotta know on the research side, we usually spend years studying stuff like this before we make a decision one way or the other. What about vitamins and herbals? There's a lot of that out there. You need to know that typically speaking, unless you're deficient in one of these, there's been no evidence that they make a difference either. And again, that's kind of hard to tease out in the literature. I threw pineapple stem in there just because I think this is kind of interesting. And please don't go out and buy pineapple for this. But um, in uh, Australia, they actually are looking at a medication and one of the ingredients is actually pineapple stem, but it's a nasal medication used to inactivate COVID-19 uh, through nasal spray. Again, don't go up and buy pineapple stem, but my point behind that is, is we are looking at everything and looking at all options in terms of ways that we can reduce the spread or reduce the severity of this disease. Remdesivir is really the only medicine we've got out there now that we're using with some good results, but it's by no means a silver bullet. It's a medication that's given IV, it's given in the hospital, like the intensive care unit. Um, and what it does is right now, we know that it reduces hospital um, admission time. So if, if you were sick with COVID, and let's say without the medicine, you were gonna be there for 14 days. With the medicine, you'll be there about seven days. So it cuts your hospital time in half. That's good news. Nobody wants to be in the hospital longer than you wanna be. So we like that. The mortality data is okay. We think it's gonna get better. What we mean by that is, yeah, fewer people died that got remdesivir, but it wasn't like a huge number of people. So it wasn't statistically significant. There's a new study out that actually adds remdesivir to an uh, antiviral medication that's showing some promise. So we'll kind of stay tuned and see how that turns out. Convalescent plasma is um, actually showing good results of that. Convalescent plasma means that you had COVID-19 and you have strong antibodies. 
I'm going to draw your blood. And I'm going to give it to somebody who, and I'm going to spin it down, take the plasma, and I'm going to give that plasma to somebody who's really sick with it. So basically, I'm giving them your antibodies. We've used that before, like in Ebola and other viral um, um, outbreaks across the world, and actually had good results on it. So we're still kind of waiting to see. It doesn't have FDA approval yet, but that, that's showing promise. And then steroids and heparin, again, those are showing some promise there. Steroids, dexamethasone is cheap and it's generic, and that actually is showing some very good results in hospitalized patients uh, in terms of death rate. So we're, we're excited to see that. Um, and then there's, on the heparin piece, that's actually a blood thinner. The reason why I put that in there is because it's being uh, noticed to bind to the COVID spike protein. You remember the spike protein in the beginning? It's how it enters into your cells. It kind of acts as a dummy molecule. There's a dummy drug, and basically it rather bind to the heparin than bind to your cells. So that's a good thing. What about a vaccine? Where are we on vaccines? You need to know there's about 100 different vaccine manufacturers that are rushing right now to try to make the vaccine and try to get it out there. And I realize rushing can also cause some anxiety, so I'll talk about that. There's four major manufacturers right now that are in the lead. Moderna, AstraZeneca, Oxford, the Chinese co uh, company called uh, CanSino, and Pfizer. Um, all of these, um, I think all of these companies are getting federal dollar backing. Um, you need to know that all of the vaccines right now that these companies are producing from the trials that we're looking at all look really good. So that's all very positive. Um, but to make a vaccine or even a medication that's safe, you've got to test it. And it goes through three different phases. There's phase one, two, and three. In phase one, we, we tested on a few dozen people. In phase two, we tested on a few hundred people. And in phase three, we tested on a few thousand people. So one of these is in phase three trials now, which is great. Another one's in phase two. So it, hopefully it'll be moving, moving forward to phase three uh, shortly. But the big deal behind this is typically you have to wait and get through all those phases of trials before you can actually make a decision, um, or excuse me, before the FDA will make a decision and give you approval to, to then mass produce it. We're doing something different here, and this is called the at-risk financial model. I say at-risk, really we the taxpayers are at risk because the federal government's the one paying the money for this. So basically the US government has spent about $6.6 .6 billion paying these companies saying, we want you to produce the vaccine right now. So that started a couple of months ago. So a couple of months ago, we went ahead and started manufacturing several of these vaccines right now in the hopes that the tests will come out good, the results will come out good, it'll be an effective, safe vaccine, and we can start using it in 2021. And that's what everybody asks too, when will we see these first doses? At best case scenario right now, from everything that I can read, we will see the first doses available probably mid-December, mid-December, and it's probably gonna be a small amount, maybe only 100 million doses or so. The problem with 100 million doses is that it's a two-dose vaccine, which means that it would only really treat 50 million people. It'll go to the high-risk groups first, the elderly as well as the frontline healthcare workers. Um, in terms of the vaccine being widely available for, for everybody, probably February or March, that's probably where we're looking at right now. I've heard a few people talk about it being like late spring. I really think that, that it'll be more the February, March timeline where we'll actually see the vaccine be widely available. Um, obviously that's an issue because that means we won't have it for this coming um, uh, season, uh, this fall winter season now. So Dr. Spikes, you're just full of good news. No medication, no vaccine, and testing's not that great. What do we do? Well, we do what we're doing now. We limit the spread. And that's why we make such a big deal about staying six feet apart and not coming in contact with someone who's COVID positive. This is going to be a bigger issue as schools open. I don't think the general public for the most part really understands this, so that's why I wanted to take time to talk about it now. A positive contact, and that means you came in contact with somebody that's COVID positive. You're considered a positive contact if you're less than six feet or more from that person for more than 15 minutes, even if you're wearing a cloth mask. So if I'm wearing my cloth mask, and I'm talking to Casey Pierce, and we're two feet away, and we have a 30 minute meeting, and I find out later that day that he's positive for COVID-19, I have to self quarantine for 14 days. No ifs, ands, or buts. That's gonna, and it already has, that's gonna create a lot of people in quarantine just by maybe one or two people that are positive. And we're already seeing that across the country. I'll talk about that in just a second. 
Hand washing is obviously important. And again, I'll reiterate the three ply 70 30 blend mask that's helpful. I get this question as well. What about herd immunity? Let's talk about herd immunity for a second. Herd immunity means that uh, more people in the population are immune to it. And they got immune to it by one of two ways. Either they got infected and got sick and got over it, or they got the vaccine. Well, in this case, we know we don't have a vaccine. So the only way that people could get immune to this is to get infected. Well, to get infected, that means, you know, for, for herd immunity to work, and the numbers are kind of being thrown around, but in general, for herd immunity to work, you've got to have between 50 to 70% of the population needs to be immune, or in our case, infected, because we don't have a vaccine. So 50 to 70% of the population. When we talk about the United States, that's about 165 million people, 165 to 231 million people that need to be infected. Currently, the estimates are, and you'll notice these are higher estimates than what you're hearing in the, in the, um, in the public, and I'll tell you why in a second. Current estimates are that about 55 million people in the U.S. have been infected, which is about 10 times what the current numbers are in terms of actually identified cases. Here in the state of Arkansas, that would mean that 1.5 million to 2.1 million people need to have been infected. And our current estimate is about 540,000. So we are far below what is needed for herd immunity. Um, some people have made the comment about, well, why don't we just all go get sick and then get over it? The problem is, and I'll show you that in a second too, our deaths would skyrocket and we would overwhelm the hospitals and you and your family member might not have a doctor, nurse, or ventilator in the event that someone in your family or you get sick. And so that's not a great idea at all. That's why we talk about flattening the curve, and I'll, I'll get to that in a second. When we talk about the social distancing policies, and, and I think this bears uh, mentioning, there's a difference between isolation and quarantine. And this gets confused. Um, it even gets confused sometimes amongst the medical community. There is a distinct difference between quarantine and isolation. And if you still, if it's still not clear after I talk about it, please go to the CDC website. They do a, a good job of discussing it as well. You're in isolation if you are COVID positive. So if you get swabbed or if you are diagnosed as COVID positive, I kind of discussed, discussed with you earlier, I had a patient whose COVID test was negative. However, they had classic symptoms of COVID loss of taste of sense of smell, uh, smell and taste, headache, muscle aches, fatigue, shortness of breath, just classic COVID symptoms. They had COVID. It's just that likely the virus had migrated down the back of the throat and the test was not valid. You go into isolation immediately. Isolation means that you're at home and you're away from others for a minimum of 10 days. There's a if, you can, you, know, you can return to work after that as long as you have no fever for at least 24 hours, not using any medicines to drop it like Tylenol or ibuprofen, and your symptoms have improved. So they should have gotten better from day one. What if I'm positive and don't have symptoms? And our younger population see in this. It doesn't matter. You're still at home for 10 days because you can spread the virus and you can get others infected. Well, what if I test out? What if I'm home for two days and I get a test that says I'm negative? This has been a debate amongst the Arkansas Department of Health. Um, the CDC kind of clouds the water. At the end of the day, the answer is generally no. You can't test out of it. Quarantine means you came in close contact. And I'm going to make a big deal about quarantine because far more people are going to fall into the quarantine bucket than the isolation bucket initially. So quarantine, this is where I described to you a second ago, Casey Pierce and I were close together, um, and one of us has COVID-19. We were less than six feet for more than 15 minutes, even if we were both wearing masks. That doesn't matter. Now, I have to quarantine if Casey was positive. You can't test out of that. And what I mean by that is, let's say I'm in quarantine for 14 days. Let's say on day five, I really want to go back to work. I've got things I need to do. I take a test and I'm negative. Doesn't matter. Let's say on day 10, I take a test and I'm negative. It doesn't matter. The reason why is because the virus can actually hang out in your body and you may not actually have replication of the virus. It may take a while for it to actually reproduce. It's typically two to 14 days. For some individuals, it can be up to 14 days. For most, the days are actually three to five. So typically it's day three or five, but it's been as long as 14. What we can't have happen is, let's say I decided in quarantine, I was, you know, I'm ready to go back to work on day five or six. I test and I'm negative. Hey, great, I can go back to work. 
but the virus is really in my body reproducing. All of a sudden now I'm shedding on day nine or 10 and I go to see my grandmother in the nursing home or I go, you know, what something like that, I'm around people and I happen to take my mask off just for a minute and I infect an entire group that I'm around. And that's why you can't test out of quarantine. Quarantine is 14 days, no ifs, ands, or buts. Why do we talk about flattening the curve? We talk about flattening the curve because we know it works. And I'll talk about the Spanish influenza of 1918 in a second as well. But we know it makes a difference. And this is a tale of two cities. This is in uh, Philadelphia and St. Louis in 1918, as you can see here. And you see the dots in the bottom left-hand corner when social distancing was enacted based on when their first case was. You can see that St. Louis reacted very quickly and implemented social distancing measures. Philadelphia waited until after a parade of 200,000. Um, and then after that parade, then they implemented it. Well, the damage had been done by then, and you see what happened to the number of deaths in Philadelphia versus St. Louis. It also significantly overwhelmed their healthcare system to the point where they were rationing care. We've seen some of this happen in Europe. We don't want this to happen in the US. That's why we talk about continuing to flatten the curve. And when we look at our data here in the US compared to the United Kingdom, that's kind of what happened. Now, this is much higher than we would have liked. I, I, I need you to know that this, this curve uh, flattened at a, at a much higher level up in the 20,000 range. We much, would have much rather been a lot lower. But March the 11th, if you'll remember and think back, and I realize that it seems like it was years ago, it wasn't. March the 11th, that's about the time where most states in the United States put in an emergency order or shut down. Within a few days, plus or minus this March 11th date, is with most states in the country did an emergency order of, or did a shutdown. This is important for you to understand, and I want to make this very clear. April the 11th is when we really started seeing the flattening. That's important because it's about four weeks after the, the initial change was implemented, and that's about how long it takes to see it. So if you implement a change, certainly in the middle of a pandemic, across a community, it'll take a while to see it. You're not gonna see the effects immediately. Same thing's true with the mask ordinance, and I'll show you that in just a second as well. Here we are in the state of Arkansas. These dates should be somewhat um, familiar to you. May the 4th, that was a date that many states, Arkansas included, reopened. You'll see over the four week period, and again, this is, this is not at all um, uh, harping on, on anything, any decisions that was made. This is just the way the virus works. The virus moves from person to person. The more people that are around, the more likely it is to jump from person to person. The less people that it has, you know, ability to contact, the less that happens. So we see a month later where our cases were in June 4th, and then moving up to July 20th. July 20th is the date that we had a statewide mask order put in place. And you can see how we've started now to flatten out and even a bit of a downward trend, though some of those numbers may be a bit questionable. And we can talk about that in a second. Moving now to what the current situation is here in the United States. The US has about 5.5 million cases. The actual cases are probably about 10 times that. So it's probably more likely about 50. And that's kind of a generally accepted um, uh, number um, amongst researchers and amongst scientists is that we're off by about, a, in terms of number of cases, we're off by about a factor of 10. So about 55 million cases. Deaths are at about 173,000. Uh, there's debate back and forth on that. The number is probably underrepresented. That number is probably higher than 173,000. Uh, we actually are doing a better job of, this is gonna sound strange, tracking COVID-19 cases and deaths than we do tracking influenza. Those are more estimates that the CDC does on an annual basis. Looking here at the United States, you can see the front runners in terms of number of cases, California, Texas, and Florida. Again, the group that gobbled up most of our resources in terms of testing. Um, I threw Georgia in there because I think they're an interesting case study in and of themselves once they reopened. They really made no changes at all in terms of backing down. There's no mask orders. Uh, California, Texas, and Florida have all implemented new orders in terms of restaurants, bars, uh, masking, and there's been so so there's been some backing down of the reopening. 
Um, and you see where New York is, that was certainly the epicenter in the beginning. Um, and they right now, I think are hitting a positivity rate of about 1% or so, one to 2%, which is amazing. Uh, but they are just now about to start reopening uh, uh, schools and other things. And you see where Arkansas is there as well. In the United States, you can see where our cases have gone down. That first uh, blip there um, that you see where it says seven day average, that is largely the New York, New Jersey, Connecticut, um, uh, uh, kind of the epicenter pieces. And then you'll see that the rest of the country kind of lag and caught up with a lot of the other, other states hitting there at the mid-July period. Number of deaths in the bottom right-hand corner, something you need to know about deaths is they typically lag behind number of cases. So typically you'll have your number of cases may go up first, followed by hospitalization rate, and then deaths will be behind that because you don't, Typically, it's not a diagnosis and a death on the say at the same day. It's going to lag by about four weeks, anywhere from two to four weeks. Here in the state of Arkansas, this is data. I know the governor is giving this update now, so these numbers have changed. But about 54,000 uh, total cases, about 6,000 active cases here in Craighead County. We've got 181 positives, uh, 13 deaths. Um, the total deaths in the state of Arkansas are 631. Um, current estimates are that that number will double in the next 30 days, and we'll talk about uh, predictions as well. When we break down by uh, demographics uh, based on age uh, and by race, you can see where that, uh, those trend lines are. What I want to um, draw your attention to on this graph is that I want you to see the top right-hand corner in terms of number of cases. Only about 11% are your senior citizens, 65 and older. However, on the left-hand side, 70% of the deaths come from that age group. So this is very much um, a disease and a virus that attacks uh, the elderly um, at a much higher rate in terms of mortality. So uh, need, to, need to be on guard for our vulnerable populations, specifically those over the age of 65. They have a much harder time of this uh, than the younger ones. What other piece to consider? We talk about children. That number is going up, um, as is nationally. The number of cases of children are going up. Largely, we kept kids at home. Once we shut down schools and everything closed down in the spring, so they didn't really have an opportunity to get infected. That's going to all change here in the coming weeks. In Craighead County, you can see where our trend line is. Um, and this also can be followed. Um, uh, you can also, as you look at the dates there, you can see uh, typically where our numbers were. Um, you know, May the 4th, whenever we, whenever we had reopening, and about uh, 30 days after that, into June, you can see we saw a spike, and then we saw an uptick. I think what happened, and again, this is all just based on population movement. These are people getting, you know, just relaxed. They want to go back out with their friends. They want to hang out. They want to go to restaurants. They want to go to, um, you know, uh, events and things of that nature, which again is where the virus can spread from person to person, and I think that's what we're seeing. A lot of this happened after July 4th, um, and it's that people have been more mobile uh, within our community. I get this a lot, so I thought I'd throw these two slides in in terms of what's the real difference between influenza and COVID-19. Um, let's just talk briefly about testing, treatment, and vaccines. Um, influenza, you need to know we've got a great rapid test. We could test you right now in our clinic, uh, pretty much any clinic in, uh, in this region for flu. You can walk in and get a rapid flu test, and it's pretty accurate and pretty sensitive. We've got great anti-flu medications. Tamiflu works really, really well, and it's, and it's approved for all ages. We've also got Relenza, um, and we've got great vaccines. We've got the high-dose vaccine for senior citizens. We've got a quad and a trivalent, and they're widely available. And you've probably come in contact with influenza. What I mean by that is you've probably got some sort of natural immunity because you've been infected before. For SARS-CoV-2 uh, or COVID-19, we just don't have any of that. And that's the worry that most health experts have going into this fall and this winter. No vaccine, no good medication. We're still struggling with testing on a virus that uh, really your immune system probably hasn't seen. That's where the area of concern comes from. When we talk about the numbers, um, and this is where um, I'll, I'll mention again, infections per season. Uh, you know, right now we're at about 54. That, that number's off. Um, it, it changes uh, almost daily. Uh, that number's off a little bit. Uh, but really, it's about 10 times that in terms of COVID numbers. You need to know our influenza numbers are also estimates. Uh, by and large, we make estimates each year on seasonal flu. I get a lot of questions also about the mortality rate. So let's talk about that just for a second. Number one, it's extremely difficult to try to figure out what the mortality rate is in the middle of a pandemic. That's very, very hard to do. 
However, the CDC is accumulating data and looking at what that actually looks like. So that's what you see in the top right hand corner there. You can see it increases with age and you can see in general the accepted mortality rates about 0.65%, which is much higher than our influenza, seasonal influenza mortality, which is a 0.1%. So almost six and a half times higher in terms of mortality. So what's next? Well, like I said, the virus spreads from person to person. Uh, we're still, luckily, we're seeing some good information on lasting immunity. We thought for a while that the immunity wouldn't last. So some recent evidence shows that maybe it does last longer than we thought. That would be great. Um, we initially thought that kids weren't that susceptible to the infection or to the virus. We know that that's not really true, and we're going to be waiting. We'll, we'll get more data, obviously, in the coming months on this. But certainly those ages 10 to 19, those ages 10 to 19 spread the virus as much or more as adults do. So any of your high school, junior high, and middle schoolers, uh, they can spread it as much as an adult can. Right now, the elementary school kids um, don't seem to spread it as much, but I'm gonna caution you on that. We don't have much data. And so because we close schools down pretty much globally, we don't have a lot of data on little bitty kids. More of that will come as schools open across the globe and across the country. Um, so it's kind of a, of a wait and see. Haven't we done this before? What did we learn from 1918? Well, the Spanish influenza, those of you may remember this, they, they masked up. And now they didn't know about social distancing. They didn't know about the six foot rule because they didn't have that kind of evidence then, but they didn't have medicines, uh, medication, vaccines, or testing. And so that's all they had. Obviously, we're in a much better position. Our technological advances, our medical advances, we're just in a, in a different world compared in terms of our ability to manage this, even though we don't have some of those same things. I did think this was interesting. I pulled the history in terms of what did they do for schools? Because we follow kind of the same course as the 1918 influenza. What did they do? Well, apparently across the, across the country, the vast majority of schools were closed. The only schools that really opened were the large school system in New York and in Chicago. Now in Chicago, most parents kept their kids at home, so it was like they were closed anyway. New York was interesting. Because of the population density, it was safer for the kids to go to school because at the school there was clean water, there was clean air, and they actually had doctors and nurses assigned to the schools to be able to actually treat kids right there on site. So in terms of the, um, the cleanliness and the ability to actually have, you know, hot meal and that sort of thing, kids were better off going to school in New York. So I thought that was interesting. I thought I'd add that. This is what actually the curve looked like, which is what our concern has been for COVID-19, is that we'll, we saw this and that really this is what we're expecting to see this fall. We're still kind of waiting to see. The issue that most of your predictions um, are looking at is K-12 and colleges going back in. We can already see across the country how that's working out. States like Georgia, Tennessee, Oklahoma, um, around us, uh, and Mississippi. Estimated 56,000 um, school age kids in the United States with about 20 million college kids. Uh, here in the state of Arkansas, uh, many of them will be going back starting Monday. These, tw these 10 models in the bottom um, are all models that I've pulled. We look at about 12 different national models in terms of trends. All of them um, are expecting the case numbers to go up and it's largely based on the fact that schools are going to reopen and we do expect uh, the spread to continue. More close to home, the UAMS School of, uh, or College of Public Health um, just recently updated their predictions. Uh, remember, in terms of number-wise, here in the state of Arkansas, we've got about 480,000 uh, school-aged kids with about 160,000 college kids. Right now, the UAMS um, prediction is tracking pretty much what it was forecasting in terms of, of cases and in deaths. I just want—I pulled this excerpt out of their recent um, guideline, and I wanted to people to, to know this, specifically this area here, their midterm pro projections. Um, again, if nothing changes, We'll be at about 100,000 cases with 1,100 deaths by the end of September. Just so that you remember, we're about half that on both of those right now. So a little over uh, 30 days away, uh, their prediction is that we're gonna double uh, to where we are. And again, a lot of that is based on, as you can see, um, um, school opening. So this is, again, this is just the way the virus spreads. This is, um, you know, it goes from person to person. It's looking for the next person to infect. When we talk about post-COVID, because I get this question, this is becoming a bigger deal. If you want to look this up, there's something called long COVID or you'll read about the long haulers. 
Um, typically, the, the, the average person is a female age 44 that was normally fit or healthy, and they're having longer um, issues with this. What I mean by that is sustained symptoms that are lasting weeks to months afterwards. This is still completely new to us. So we're collecting data and trying to figure out what that is. On the right hand side, you'll see um, a graph that we pulled that I pulled from JAMA that uh, shows the most common symptoms that occur after uh, COVID-19 infection, which is typically the fatigue and the trouble breathing. And when I say trouble breathing, I mean like trouble breathing, like walking from your living room to your kitchen. Um, some of these individuals need home oxygen. It, it's variable, it's extremely variable. There's gonna be some genetic component we have yet to really identify. The problem um, on the heart and lung damage, if you've been following college sports at all, this is why the MAC and the Big Ten conferences uh, pulled back. Their physicians there were reading data out of the European Journal of Cardiology, and there was a study that came out of Germany, and it was showing that in these younger uh, patients, even that had mild to no symptoms, that there was heart damage, like there was, there was heart damage that could be picked up on an MRI or on an echocardiogram, which is the old side of the heart. That's obviously concerning, especially if you're trying to push some of these kids athletically. And so I, I think that that was probably one of the biggest reasons why those two conferences and other conferences that are looking at it have pulled out. Um, symptoms do, for the most, for most part, symptoms resolve within a week or two, but it's this group that seems to persist uh, beyond weeks or more. Again, this is still new to us, so we're not quite sure what to think. You know, we're only seven months into this. So this is data that we're just gonna still continue to collect over the next few months and even years as we publish more uh, and learn more. All right, I realized that that was long uh, and fast, but um, hopefully I was able to fill in um, and answer a lot of questions uh, that may have been burning, that may have been in your mind there um, in terms of COVID-19. I'll kick it back to you, Casey. Thank you, Dr. Spites. So we've heard from the, the public health uh, concern and the, the impact from a scientific standpoint. Now we wanna talk about the economic impact that this virus has had specifically to our area. And we're very fortunate to have Mr. Clint O'Neill with us today. Clint is the Executive Vice President of Global Business for the Arkansas Economic Development Commission. Um, he has 13 years of experience in economic development. Clint is responsible for overseeing the following AEDC divisions business development, community development, existing business, marketing and research, film, military affairs, and minority and women-owned business enterprise. Quinn also serves as Governor Hutchison's designee to designate, excuse me, his designee to the Delta Regional Authority. Before, journey, before joining AEDC, Clint served as the Vice President of Business Recruitment for the Missouri Partnership, the state's principal business recruitment and marketing organization. Quinn is a graduate of the Economic Development Institute at the University of Oklahoma and holds a master's degree in community and economic development from the University of Central Arkansas. He and his wife, Heather, live in Conway with their four children. And Clint O'Neill, Mr. Clint O'Neill, it's my pleasure to turn the program over to you. Casey, thanks for having me. It's, uh, it's an honor to, to uh, be invited uh, to, to speak, to share the stage with, with Dr. Spites. Uh, let me see if I can... Get this up. Um, okay, can you see the screen? Okay. All right. I'll Looks see. great, Clint. Okay, thanks, Casey. Um, well, again, just uh, just my thanks to the uh, New York Institute of Technology at ASU and to uh, Dr. Spites and his team, to uh, to Mark Young and his team at the Jonesboro uh, Regional Chamber of Commerce in Jonesboro. Uh, economic development partner of ours at the Arkansas Economic Development Commission. Um, I, I'm going to give a, uh, an, an overview here of just kind of a snapshot of where we're at in economic development in the state of Arkansas. Um, I'll have some objective uh, numbers, uh, just kind of the reality of where we're at with employment and unemployment. Uh, but I think you'll also see as we go throughout the presentation, um, I'm not an economist. I'm, I'm more in marketing and sales. And so it's definitely going to be with the twist of uh, some of the things that we uh, talk to prospects about, the ways that we interact with companies in Arkansas to uh, encourage expansion, encourage job creation in Arkansas, the way that we talk to companies from out of state when we're 
uh, on recruitment trips and when we're hosting prospects in our state. Um, so the first few slides are just some, uh, some, some shots from around Arkansas, as a lot of people are doing uh, more staycations than, than getting away. Um, hope you've had the opportunity uh, to experience uh, all that Arkansas has to offer is the natural state. A uh, beautiful state, great for, uh, for hiking, camping, uh, a lot of outdoor outings. Um, here on this photo, you see what has become a couple of uh, rare commodities uh, that kind of has to do with the changing times in the economy. If you go to buy a bicycle these days, uh, they're, in, they're in rare supply, which is, uh, is a great thing. A lot of people are taking advantage of the great outdoors, same for, uh, for kayaks and other outdoor activities. And again, hope you've had the opportunity to, uh, to get out, to explore, uh, to do some, some hiking, uh, to do some outdoor activities. Uh, but just kind of a, a level set on some of the advantages of doing business in Arkansas. And then we'll move into uh, some of the numbers that, that we've seen over the last uh, six to 12 months or so. But uh, in case you're not familiar with the business climate in Arkansas, here's some of the things that we always tout uh, some of the ways that uh, companies that are doing business in Arkansas uh, can, can uh, find the advantage over other states. Uh, we're a low cost market uh, with a great location, uh, great natural resources, a trained workforce, uh, and, and some of the ways that this has been recognized by uh, and validated by third parties is a uh, uh, CNBC came up with a study in 2019 on the uh, cost of doing business across 50 states and Arkansas is the third lowest overall cost of doing business, uh, third lowest overall cost of living index, um, as I mentioned on our location, 40% uh, of the U.S. population uh, is within a day's drive, uh, making it advantageous for a lot of uh, companies in the manufacturing, logistics, supply chain, uh, low union rates, which are important to a lot of companies that we do business with. Uh, seventh, uh, ranked seventh in best quality of life, according to U.S. News and World Report. Uh, seventh highest percentage of workforce in manufacturing. This is a statistic that's important to uh, a lot of the manufacturers that we work with, any company that's looking to set up a new location is going to be looking at uh, where are the states and the communities uh, that manufacturing is a great job. It's, it's, uh, it's part of the culture. A lot of people are skilled in manufacturing and they find that to be a great job. Certainly the case in Arkansas, certainly the case in Jonesboro. Uh, income tax cuts. Uh, signed by the Arkansas legislature um, in 2005, 15, 2017, and 2019. And uh, Arkansas, as constitutionally mandated, has had a balanced budget since 1945. This is not something that every state can say. Uh, this is something that uh, can provide predictability for companies, uh, for people, that uh, a balanced budget leads to uh, keeping taxes low, keeping uh, some predictability within the budget there, and something that Arkansas has been able to maintain even throughout the pandemic. Uh, so a couple different ways to look at unemployment numbers. Here's a chart that kind of gives a week by week look. Um, I guess for comparison's sake, uh, if we were to go uh, prior to March of 2020, at which this chart starts at, you would see that the average level of unemployment claims is right around 1,000 uh, per week. So there's always gonna be activity of new companies coming in with, with companies having um, in sometimes seasonal or temporary layoffs and sometimes uh, permanent layoffs. But you go from, uh, from around 1,000 a week uh, to this uh, incredible spike, as you see there, uh, one of the first weeks in April and then, uh, and then beyond. Um, the next slide overlays um, the traditional state unemployment figures uh, that you saw on the last chart with the initial claims from the uh, pandemic unemployment assistance 
this is the uh, funding that was passed by the federal government uh, to provide a system, a mechanism of unemployment insurance type of benefits to those that were not previously uh, qualified to receive unemployment insurance. So uh, currently, if you're a W-2 employee for a company and that's registered with the UI trust fund and UI system, uh, that's what's shown in the, in the blue. Uh, for those um, independent contractors, the gig economy workers, uh, those that were not registered with the, the, the W-2 wages and the UI system, uh, the federal government passed this very helpful means of support uh, called the Pandemic Unemployment Assistance, which has been able to help a lot of people around the country and a lot of people in Arkansas. Uh, but another way to look at this, I just kind of want to show a comparison between some labor statistics from December of 2019 and to fast forward to the current statistics that we have on, on hand uh, today. So in December of 2019, uh, we were sitting at a 3.6 percent uh, unemployment rate. Um, another way to look at this is how many Arkansans were working? What's the total non-farm employment? At that time it was 1.286 million. What this represents as, uh, as you look at the employment uh, charts over the past several years is this represents a time where we could say that more Arkansans were working than ever before. And in fact, not only in December of 2019 were more Arkansans working than ever before, but you could also take a look at the previous 10 years from December of 2009 to December of 2019, and wages in Arkansas per capita income had grown uh, beyond any of our neighboring states. So the percentage per capita income growth over a 10 year period was higher in Arkansas than any of our neighboring states. We were at an all-time high number of Arkansans working uh, with a 3.6% uh, unemployment rate. Um, so as you'll see, because of the pandemic, um, obviously we've, we've gone down from here, but, but this will kind of be uh, certainly our goal, our baseline uh, to get back up to where we can say those two things uh, in the future. More Arkansans are working than ever before, higher per capita income growth rate than all neighboring states. But as you'll see here, if you take a look at the figure of January of 2015, when Governor Hutchinson started his first term, this represents around 100,000 more Arkansans working than we're working at that time. Uh, so it's, um, it's actually tomorrow that we'll receive the July unemployment data. So the most current statistics that we have on hand today is the June 2020 stats. Um, and what came out in July, uh, reflecting the, the, the June unemployment rate, showed Arkansas at 8%, uh, total non-farm uh, employment of 1.2 uh, million Arkansans working. So you see there that's uh, it's around 24,000 more than were working in January 2015, still above that mark, but, uh, but around 75,000 still below the mark. Uh, that we were in December of 2019. So uh, you would never think that uh, the 8% the unemployment uh, is good, uh, but certainly compared to, uh, to where we were at with these June rankings <clears throat> against the national average was uh, more favorable than the uh, U.S. unemployment <clears throat> of, uh, of 11%. <coughs> Excuse me. So one of the things I want to do is uh, is just talk about these inspiring Arkansas businesses. Uh, there are, I believe, 11 logos up here, and uh, that's that's only because of space issues on the screen. Certainly, uh, certainly more than that. Certainly over 100 uh, companies that we've engaged with uh, that we've documented some stories from inspiring Arkansas businesses. These are companies that. Um, uh, you know, as Dr. Spite showed on the screen, I believe it was March 11th when Arkansas had its first announced case of COVID-19. There are so many companies in the state that reacted in ways that, uh, that, that we started this uh, social media campaign called AR Biz Strong uh, 
just recognizing uh, some of these these business heroes. Uh, you have companies like Rocktown Distillery that uh, started making hand sanitizer, as did uh, Pernod Ricard, uh, just kind of stopped what they were doing on the distillery side, making a lot of hand sanitizer, uh, donating a lot of this hand sanitizer uh, to local hospitals. Uh, there's been a lot of donations recently to schools, as schools prepare to, uh, to, to go back in session. Um, companies like NicePack and Jonesboro that uh, that are going to great lengths to protect their employees. They're actually even hiring uh, to meet demand in this time of, of COVID-19. Uh, Pradco in uh, Fort Smith, uh, PPE production, making face shields and, and more hand sanitizer. Uh, companies like Tyson and Walmart and George's uh, that are all paying their employees uh, pandemic bonuses, uh, whether it be through a one-time bonus or a temporary bump in pay. Uh, but so many of these companies uh, just doing great things that uh, if you get a chance to look on our website, it's www.arkansasedc.com slash COVID-19. Uh, we highlight a lot of these, what we call inspiring Arkansas businesses. Um, and if you're, a, if you're a business leader listening in and, uh, and have something along these lines that we could highlight, uh, please feel free to, to, to reach out. We'd love to highlight what you're doing to keep your employees and your customers safe uh, throughout this time. Um, so the private sector has responded very favorably um, with, with the things that have been mentioned. I'll talk a little bit about the, uh, the public response in a minute. Uh, here's a slide just a little bit on the uh, public-private collaboration. Um, Governor Hutchinson set up an economic recovery task force made up of uh, public sector and private sector leaders across the state, across a variety of, of in industries and interests. And uh, it's just been incredibly encouraging to, uh, to watch this group of leaders come together uh, to work on ways to move the economy forward in a safe way, in a uh, data-driven way. Uh, there's a lot of good information on this website, arkansasready.com. There are several industries in which uh, guidelines and best practices are laid out uh, for, for industry leaders to, to be able to see what phases uh, we're on, what the uh, regulations are uh, for any given business, for any given industry. Uh, before I dive in a little bit to the uh, state programs <clears throat> and the response of the Arkansas Economic Development Commission, I just want to give a shout out to, uh, to, to our partners uh, here in the state and the federal government with this, with the U.S. Small Business Administration. Um, a couple of programs, uh, most notably the Paycheck Protection Program, was just uh, a, a really good uh, business assistance program that uh, fortunately a lot of uh, Arkansans were benefited from, uh, a lot of Arkansas businesses, um, in addition to some of their other programs, including the Economic Injury Disaster Loan Program. But through the Paycheck Protection Program alone, these are Arkansas stats to 43,669 Arkansas companies were able to take advantage of over $3.3 billion through the PPP program. And again, just uh, a shout out to not only SBA, uh, but, but truly to the banking community in Arkansas. So many bankers uh, working around the clock as this PPP a program was administered through local banks. So many banks in Arkansas uh, working day and night to understand the program, understand how to help uh, business owners, business leaders in their communities, and did a fantastic job at that. Uh, but three programs that I'd like to highlight from the uh, Arkansas Economic Development standpoint, uh, the first one being the Community Development Block Grant, uh, working with our partners at the uh, Housing and Urban Development Agency um, in Washington, D.C., uh, AEDC administers CDBG grants. Uh, we were allowed an exemption to make some modifications to how we administered uh, a particular pot of funding that we had. We were able to reallocate $10 million uh, to 27 rural hospitals, made grants between $250,000 and $500,000 uh, for those uh, hospitals. Uh, to use, as you see there on the screen, for equipment, supplies, and other operating costs uh, related to COVID-19. 
uh, over these 27 hospitals represents just under 8,000 employees uh, that were benefited with those funds. Uh, Governor Hutchinson has what's called a Governor's Quick Action Closing Fund uh, that he set aside $6 million from his Quick Action Closing Fund in order to be able to help small businesses. The Attorney General, Leslie Rutledge, uh, allocated $3 million from a uh, Consumer Education Enforcement uh, Settlement Fund uh, to add to this amount. So a total of $9 million was used to set up what we call the Quick Action Bridge Loan Program. This was at a time uh, early within the COVID-19 uh, outbreak where we knew that there were some discussions at the Small Business Administration about PPP and other things, uh, but, but companies needed money um, in the short term. And so we set up this bridge loan program uh, designed for small businesses, all industries. Uh, so, so the uh, parameters there of eligibility between two and 50 uh, Arkansas employees. And through this quick action bridge loan program, we were able to help 483 companies um, that represented just over 6,600 jobs, uh, getting money out to these companies. Uh, these are forgivable loans, meaning it's a loan that will be paid back either uh, either paid back the money or would have a uh, forgiveness feature based on job retention. So uh, it certainly meets uh, what we're going after there is job retention and recruitment and something that uh, companies needed at that time was, was fast uh, money in a uh, bridge loan fashion. Um, after the PPP, a lot of companies were helped in a lot of big ways, as, as you saw on the screen, over $3.3 billion. Um, we had some funding from the CARES Act uh, in the state of Arkansas, and one of the eligible ways that we could use that money was to, uh, to help businesses in, in a new way, and at this time was late April, early May. We thought uh, this is a time where there are uh, some companies, unfortunately, uh, some businesses did have to close. There were uh, restaurants were closed to dine in. There were uh, dental offices and a lot of uh, a lot of offices in the medical community that were closed. There were uh, gyms and and uh, barber shops and, and a lot of salons, tattoo parlors. Unfortunately, uh, because of the close contact nature of the business, did close. And so they were looking to reopen. There were a lot of companies that were looking to resume operations, and so we stood up what we call the Ready for Business Grant Program. And this is a grant intended to help companies with just that, to resume or reopen operations, uh, funding in the amount of $1,000 per full-time employee, up to $100,000. Uh, so with this program, uh, money that could be used uh, to really do two things, restore uh, confidence and to provide safety for employees and to do the same thing for customers. Uh, wanted um, companies to, to not have to bear the financial burden of all of the things that, that go along with reconfiguring their business, with uh, buying masks and other forms of, of PPE for their employees for uh, a, a variety of ways to, uh, to, to, to put in safety measures uh, so that they could instill consumer confidence so that uh, consumers would, uh, would, would want to frequent their stores, go to their businesses, feel comfortable going back to meetings. And so uh, through this company, through, through this grant program, uh, we had uh, about 94.4% .4 of the funds were used for small businesses, 50 or fewer employees, 25% uh, were used on minority owned businesses, 33% for women owned businesses. Uh, these are grants that were awarded uh, to companies and organizations in all 75 counties, uh, around 11,500 uh, companies were able to benefit from this program, and there were about 225,000 Arkansans working for the companies that were able to uh, to benefit from this grant program. Um, you know, one thing I'll say about the uh, the measured, data-driven approach that Governor Hutchinson and and uh, the Department of Health and, and here the Department of Commerce took is uh, unfortunately there were some of those closures. Uh, however, uh, unlike other states, Arkansas never uh, issued a mandated 
stay at home order, which would have resulted in the loss of, of a lot of jobs from companies and industries that were not uh, direct, uh, direct contact uh, type of centers, as mentioned before. There was actually an article that came out a few weeks ago in Site Selection Magazine entitled, How Arkansas Saved 100,000 Jobs, which comes from a, uh, a study from an economist uh, here at the Department of Commerce uh, based on how many more jobs, a lot of those would have been temporary, but uh, were saved through that measure of not uh, issuing a stay-at-home mandate. Um, the last slide here, I wanna go through uh, what we experienced and what we are experiencing through COVID-19 is uh, a lot of downturn in the economy. It's been very unfortunate. Uh, there's been a lot of small businesses, a lot of large businesses that have taken a big hit. And, uh, and so through these programs and through other means, uh, certainly doing everything that we can at the Arkansas Economic Development Commission to, uh, to assist with those companies, to assist with uh, employees that are looking for new opportunities. Uh, but I do just wanna highlight a glimmer of hope in, in the midst of this pandemic, in, in the midst of a lot of uh, companies that are struggling. Uh, we've had a handful of announcements this summer, announcements of companies expanding their operations in Arkansas, announcements of, of companies uh, setting up uh, new operations for the first time. So just going around real quickly, uh, Amazon uh, creating a thousand jobs at their new uh, 825,000 uh, square foot fulfillment center in Little Rock, uh, Fiocchi of America, uh, creating 85 jobs, a $15 million investment in a new manufacturing facility. Uh, Lazy Boy in Siloam Springs had a decision to make. They were going through a consolidation and uh, fortunately found Arkansas to be a favorable place to do business. They ended up closing a plant in Newton, Mississippi and, uh, and consolidating those jobs, including the addition of 125 new jobs, bringing their total up to 545 Arkansans that will have the opportunity to work there in Salem Springs. Uh, Gerber uh, in Fort Smith, investing $30 million, creating uh, 50 new jobs. Again, a company that was looking at their national and international footprint on where to grow and uh, fortunately selected Arkansas for that growth. Uh, SCA Pharma, a uh, pharmaceutical compounding company growing by 180 jobs in Little Rock. It's a uh, Arkansas based company that has uh, facilities in Arkansas and in Connecticut and uh, had the confidence in their Arkansas workforce uh, to, to grow that facility. Signode in Fordyce, a uh, great company, uh, lots of manufacturing facilities across their footprint internationally and uh, chose to grow in Fordyce, Arkansas, uh, 30 new jobs there. Uh, Arturis Aerospace, a company that uh, did business in California and uh, earlier this year just said enough is enough with high taxes and un unpredictable and unstable nature of doing business in California. And so they are uh, relocating their business to Arkansas and Synergy Cargo, a growing company that makes cargo trailers uh, based in Georgia, setting up a new facility in Crossit, Arkansas. Um, so just wanted to, uh, to, to share that as, uh, as that's a lot of what we do is try to encourage these companies to, uh, to grow, to grow the job market in Arkansas and certainly to uh, celebrate when those, when those uh, announcements happen. And with that, happy to uh, turn it back over to Casey and take any questions. Clint, thank you very much. We had uh, several folks submit questions ahead of time. And so we've got some, some great questions for both Dr. Spites and for uh, Mr. O'Neill. And so Dr. Spites, if you're still with us, if you'll jump back on here, um, I'm gonna start with you and we'll, we'll just kind of alternate be between you. I thought this was a good one, Dr. Spites. Do you have any suggestions for dealing with employees who are suffering from COVID fatigue? How do we keep people to continue practicing good habits when we're all so tired of dealing with this thing? Um, so that, that's a good question, uh, Casey. And, and, and the, uh, I mentioned a little bit in my um, presentation about the, the post-COVID symptoms or the, uh, you know, the, the long COVID, I think is what they're calling it. Uh, we're not sure how long that's going to last. I think for most individuals, it may last. Um, you know, hopefully those symptoms only last days or weeks, but some, it does seem to persist on months and, and even still have symptoms now. 
we don't have a good answer for that. I know that there, I've read some articles that um, we have some neurologists that are putting forth some information um, and some, some ideas in terms of how best to address it. Um, they are, there are some thoughts about treating it almost like you would a fibromyalgia state. Um, and I hesitate to even say that, but there's just, it's just such a new area of, of information and a, and a new virus and a new state that we're dealing with. We're not quite sure how to manage it. Um, I will say this, when you have employees that are post COVID that, that may have legitimate symptoms that crop up afterwards, uh, that's documented in the literature. We're seeing um, uh, patients that actually kind of have rebounding symptoms that can occur, um, you know, like every couple of weeks, they have a rebound of a, you know, of a headache or, you know, fatigue or something like that. That's actually been documented in the literature. Um, when you talk about uh, the pandemic fatigue, that's a whole different uh, conversation. I think that um, uh, a lot of us, I think probably all of us have experienced that at some level. Um, Interestingly, here in the state of Arkansas in the South, I think we experienced it sooner. I'm now hearing um, uh, from a lot of my colleagues in the Northeast and specifically in New York, that they are starting to, to get uh, here and see a lot of that um, in the New York area. Um, I don't have a good answer for that. I really don't. I, the, I guess the, for me, the light at the end of the tunnel, um, which I don't believe is a train, uh, is really next spring, next summer, the 2021. And then, gosh, I, I had my, my own mother rolled her eyes when I said that. And she's like, next spring? And I was like, you know, I, I think, unfortunately, that's the position we're in. Um, I'd love to change that. I'd, I'd love to be able to say we're going to have a vaccine next month or we're going to have a great medication come out next month. There's just nothing on the horizon that shows that that's going to happen, um, and so um, unfortunately, I think it's going to be that we're, you know we're going to have to persevere through this. Um, we're going to have to just just work together as a community um, and as a public to kind of you know weather this storm. Um, I, I think all of us are being tested at some level, uh, so I, I, I hope that helps. I don't know if it does because I I have the same conversations in my own house. So, thank you, Dr. Spites. Clint, uh, one that was submitted for you. We, we've read a lot about um, companies shifting to much smaller office space. I know probably a majority of the people that are on this call today may be doing so from home. And um, that how that could potentially, from an economic standpoint, impact commercial real estate. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, well, again, I, I love these questions on what are my thoughts. I don't, I don't know that I'm so much an economist, but certainly have, uh, have some opinions. So, so happy to share those. Uh, you know, I think what we're seeing in the short term is, is we're seeing this uh, reaction to a crisis. And a lot of companies have done this really well. Um, I know here at the Arkansas Economic Development uh, Commission for state government to have a remote work policy is, uh, is, is certainly new to us. Uh, we've, we've made it work. We have found that in a lot of ways, uh, we were underutilizing technology that we're being forced to use now. So even what we're doing right now and, and through Zoom and, and we've done through a lot through Microsoft Teams and just finding a lot of ways to collaborate in an environment where for one reason or another, uh, people are, are working remotely. Uh, in the beginning, we had most of our team working remotely. Uh, we've now gone to a model where, where most people are back at the office for us, but still have uh, some working remotely. I think for a lot of companies, they're realizing that uh, first and foremost, uh, of, of primary importance to any company is, is their workforce, is their talent. And so if your top performers have children and, and school's not in session, uh, if you wanna keep your top performers, you really have to find a way to, to accommodate. And uh, a lot of companies have been forced to, uh, to come up with, with new ways uh, to accommodate their employees' needs. Um, I, I think that uh, th there's really a couple things, if I could kind of expand, um, you know, the office market, especially downtown office markets, are, are going to be thinking about two things. Uh, COVID-19 puts us in this environment where uh, people that are crowded in crowded areas are uh, obviously more likely to, uh, to, to spread the virus. And so does a downtown office space where you get a lot of people stacked on top of each other really make sense for a lot of companies when they can spread out to more rural communities or more suburban areas or go to more uh, remote work policies. And the second thing that certainly is on the mind of a lot of companies that's related to the times that we're living in 
is the civil unrest that's going on in a lot of major markets. So um, commercial real estate, in particular commercial real estate in large cities, uh, are probably looking at some risk mitigation strategies. And I think that bodes well for the state of Arkansas. It bodes well for uh, those companies that we've talked to, some privately and some have very publicly said, I'm no longer doing business in this particular area because I've, I've had it. Uh, maybe it's because of overtaxation and frustrations that have been going on for a long time. Maybe it's because of, of a lack of business friendly response to the COVID-19 pandemic. Maybe it's because of the lack of business friendly response to civil unrest. But I think a lot of those things will, uh, will shape the office space uh, market for a, for a long time. And then down to, uh, to just uh, every community and every company looking at their footprint um, so I think uh, a lot is, uh, is to be determined, to be decided on this. And again, I think in the short term, it's just kind of those fast reactions to take care of your employees. Uh, but I think there's ways that, uh, that this shaping market can be of advantage to Arkansas and uh, in particular to rural communities in Arkansas. Very interesting. Thank you, Clint. We're going to bounce back and forth. So Dr. Spites, uh, your, your turn again. Uh, you said this is COVID beyond Facebook. So I'm going to bring up one of the things I, send, I tend to see a lot on Facebook, and that's some confusion around um, how, how deaths are reported. People seem to be confused because uh, someone may go into the hospital with one illness. Um, maybe this person suffers from long-term heart disease or um, has battled cancer and received treatment. But then when they pass away, they may be listed or at least in the media, it's reported that they're, that these that these deaths are being reported as COVID deaths as opposed to cancer or COPD or, or whatever else. Can you just provide some context as to that perception and, and, the, and the, rea the, I guess the difference between the perception and the reality there? Right. Well, well, I'll say it's, you know, deaths are reported by typically the local coroner now that, you know, the physicians can, you know, can, um, can obviously determine death, um, and then the coroner, you know, reviews the medical record and that sort of thing. And it's different for every every region of the country um, and every community. But in general, um, and I've actually I've had the fortunate um, opportunity to speak to um, ER physicians in New York um, when I first kind of heard about this too. But when we talk about individuals with underlying disorders, so somebody that has COPD or has lung cancer or has heart disease. Um, and they, they die and they come in, they're COVID positive and, and they die. This is not new for us. We do the same thing with seasonal influenza. We know that influenza can tax the system. We know that someone with an underlying health condition, if they come in and they're, and they're flu positive, so to speak, and they're having uh, trouble breathing and we look at their x-ray, we look at their CT scan, looks like they have maybe a viral pneumonia, that on top of their underlying diseases can kind of tip them over into a critical state, which can um, ultimately actually uh, be the cause of their demise. And so in that situation, the flu situation I, I just described, that would be counted as a flu death. In terms of the flu going in there and basically taking advantage of the fact that this individual's already immunocompromised or, or in, a, in a reduced state of health, so to speak, they do the same thing in COVID. So I don't want people to think that there's, there aren't different rules. The CDC and, and in terms of how they decide that, it's the same that we would do for, uh, for influenza. Um, now, in terms of the actual reporting numbers, at this point, we believe those are probably underreported. Um, we know that, uh, I'll take New York, for example, I spoke to an ER physician who works through a large hospital in the Bronx in New York, um, and they were under strict um, instructions that if the individual came in coding, individual came in, you know, or and maybe they expired very quickly after getting there, even if the physician felt like it might have been COVID, they were not able to do that until they could, until they could prove that individual had COVID. And so that's going around. That's not just in New York, that's other areas. So we feel like, to be honest with you, the numbers are actually underreported. And there's some evidence to kind of show that. And the way we can do this, and actually, you know, the listeners, the viewers can actually go look this up yourselves. You can look, we have mortality trends. So we know like in the state of Arkansas about how many people die every July. And we can look over the last you know, 10, 20, 30 years and we can say, you know, on average, this is the number of people that have died you know, in Arkansas in the month of July. 
You now overlay that with the data we have now, and we see significant numbers of deaths that occur that, um, you know, COVID or non-COVID related. And so there, there's going to be a lot more information come out about this. The epidemiologists are getting a hold of it. Um, and so we'll have a better picture. It won't be for probably several years, but more likely there's more deaths than we expect actually that are occurring due to COVID. And so it's probably an underreported number rather than being overreported. Thank you, Dr. Spites. Clint, this one uh, specific to retail business. What advice do you have for retail businesses um, regarding operations post pandemic to get people back in the door and, uh, and, and patronizing them again? Yeah, it's certainly a, a good question about getting people back in the door because really there's, there's two things at hand that companies are, are facing and that's the government regulation uh, across the country. There's, there's been different regulations put on uh, on businesses, either by the state level or by the local level. Uh, fortunately, as I mentioned in Arkansas, uh, there were no uh, regulations handed down uh, to, to retail businesses uh, in that traditional sense in Arkansas. There were some retail businesses that just decided to close temporarily uh, because they just weren't seeing the foot traffic. Uh, so there's the government regulation. There's, there's what can be done legally uh, according to, to the policies of any given area. Uh, but we're moving into a stage where more importantly than the government regulation is the consumer confidence. And so stores can be open. The government policy is, is, is good with that. But the question of how to instill consumer confidence and that's one that, uh, that, that companies everywhere are wrestling with. And frankly, it's, uh, it's, it's a little different in, in every area. I think um, every individual, every family is, is kind of taking a look at uh, the risk profile of, is it safe to, to go back to a retail store? Um, you know, what are the consumer habits along those lines? And so, um, you know, I'd say, First and foremost, for any retail business owner, uh, to, to take those precautions necessary that give a strong signal uh, that you've done everything possible to keep your place safe. Uh, so the, uh, I think the businesses that, uh, as soon as the mask mandate in Arkansas was established, those businesses that are enforcing that uh, are gonna find that their, uh, their patrons, their, their, their customers are going to feel better about that uh, if it's not enforced, it kind of sets yourself up for uh, uh, looking like, you know, it it's may not be a safe place. Uh, so whether it be mask, whether it be, um, you know, the precautions of, of reconfiguring the business or the number of people um, in the store at once, uh, people certainly have to feel safe and have to have that confidence. And I think, uh, you know, once once that gains traction, uh, that, that can certainly help. I mean, as always, uh, you know, be visible on social media, other marketing venues. Uh, I think one thing uh, positive that's come about this is a lot of uh, company leaders, like community leaders, have really taken a lot of uh, thought into how we instill community pride in all communities during this time of, of, uh, of a challenging time. And so uh, you're seeing a lot more shop local type campaigns I would certainly uh, encourage companies and community leaders to, to jump on board with those efforts and uh, have people in your community take pride in shopping local and, uh, and knowing who you are um, and then all pulling through this together. Thank you very much. Dr. Spites, you hit on vaccines um, in, in your presentation, but I wanted to dig a little bit further on there. Um, how, how safe do you think they will be once they are available and how effective do they have to be to, you know, the, we, we hear that 50% effective rate. What exactly does that mean to us from a public health standpoint? So in terms of the vaccine uh, effectiveness, that varies, you know, obviously depending on the match, but normally between, you know, 50, 70, 80% or more 
um, you know, a little bit's better than nothing, so to speak. Um, I do believe that, um, and we're going to still wait and see what the information shows when it comes out. But right now, the information on the vaccine looks really good. It looks really good in terms of safety. It looks really good in terms of effectiveness. It really it looks really good in terms of just minimal side effects. So at this point, based on the data that I'm reading from the different man manufacturers of the vaccines, I really don't have any concerns about it once it comes out. I mean, that could all change, obviously, you know, as more information comes out. But um, at this point, I don't have any concerns about the vaccine um, or whether, whether I would take it or, or encourage people to take it. Well, that's encouraging. Clint, I uh, want, want to move back to you for a moment. I think you hit on this a little bit in, in your, uh, your first response here. Will Arkansas see an economic benefit from new business and residents because we're less populated and also because um, of how regulations are set up favorable for business here? Yeah, thanks, Casey. Happy to, to kind of take a crack at that and reiterate a couple of things. Let me let me start with uh, the, the you know two-part question about businesses and residents. Let me let me start with residents. I mean, certainly something that's been on our minds is a talent recruitment campaign. A lot of times, unfortunately, people grow up in Arkansas and, uh, and, and we experience this brain drain of, of we invest a lot in, uh, in students, uh, K through 12, higher education, and then uh, a lot of Arkansans move off for other opportunities. Uh, a lot of people like me, I spent seven years in Kansas City, decided to come back to the state of Arkansas because this is where I wanted to be. It's where my wife and I wanted to raise our four kids. Um, and so I, I think there's a real opportunity here um, just because there's always an opportunity to, to pitch the great assets of the state of Arkansas, but even more so now as uh, there are people that literally work from companies that have said, we're gonna do remote work forever. Um, and they're truly making those changes as we talked about to, uh, to, to their real estate. And so if, uh, if you're in a big city and you're paying uh, half of your salary to, to live in a tiny apartment, surely it comes across your mind to say, if I can work remotely, uh, you know, for what I'm getting paid here, I can get a pretty nice place in Arkansas, surrounded by natural beauty, surrounded by great quality of life and things to do, and keep my job at the old place working remotely. Uh, or it could be that uh, since the time they've left, there's been a great, uh, a lot of great opportunities arisen in the state of Arkansas for, uh, for new jobs that may not have existed the last time they lived here. So I, I think there's a real opportunity for, uh, for, for everybody on this call, for everybody that lives in Arkansas to be ambassadors for the state of Arkansas to help recruit people uh, to, to come live in our state. And especially those ones that have some sort of tie-in to the state of Arkansas, I think uh, would, would certainly be uh, some low-hanging fruit there. For new businesses, uh, as I mentioned before, um, yeah, there's a, there's a lot of things going on where uh, I think companies uh, recognize that the United States is a great place to do business. And within the United States, you have 50 different states that all have a little bit different taxation structure, all have a little bit different regulatory structure, have different institutions of higher education that provide workforce development. And so there are, there are choices out there that companies make. And, uh, and I think that we're certainly well positioned to pitch Arkansas as a place that uh, because we're a small state, we collaborate better together. We move quickly to, uh, to assist new businesses, to uh, develop workforce development programs. Uh, there's just a, a lot of uh, ways that, that, uh, that we can pull together and, uh, and punch above our weight class, uh, especially during this time. That's encouraging. Thanks, Mr. O'Neill. Well, we had questions submitted ahead of time, and uh, as both of you were giving your presentations, I was ticking through those questions because several of them were answered. So um, I think that we have, have buzzed through them. So we're going to go ahead and wrap things up. If there's anybody on the call that has something that was not answered, um, we have uh, contact information for both Dr. Spites and for Mr. O'Neill, and we'd be happy to uh, get those questions answered for you. If there's someone that needs to see this presentation that wasn't here today, we have recorded it and we will be placing it on the NYTCOM social media channels. Those handles on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram are at NYITCOM 
A-R, like NYITCOM, Arkansas. So um, be looking for that. We'll be promoting that and uh, happy to share. I um, want to again thank uh, Mr. O'Neill, Dr. Spites, for your time and the efforts that you put together. Also want to recognize Carrie White and Mark Young with the Jonesboro uh, Regional Chamber of Commerce for uh, constructing this idea and executing it. And also Neelam Joshi in our office at NYIT and the Academic Technologies Group at NYITCOM for setting all this up and making things go so smoothly today. So thanks everyone for joining us this afternoon. We hope you've benefited from it. Everybody have a great afternoon. We'll see you soon. Thank you.